So I think you don't need to be introduced to Brian. Um, Elizabeth, I think you've all met her, based in Paris. Vitor, based in Portugal. And I'm based a little bit everywhere. <laughs> I think that first of all, it's important that we talk about, well, what is it? Why is it so important that we're talking today about citizenship? I don't know how many of you are aware of the recent study, uh, the international study on citizenship in 40 countries. Uh, more than 100,000 teenagers responded. It was conducted by the IEA, the Institute of Educational Achievement, I think, and it shows that, one, democracy is seriously on the decline. We can read our newspaper, watch the news and discover that. And two, digital citizenship has been lost somewhere, somewhere in the cloud of safer internet and we really need to go back to the basis and look at what it is. Over to you, Brian. Uh, have you got an image? Not uh, yet. Not, not yet, but I, I, I think I can talk through uh, uh, my part uh, because uh, it's really in the brochure that you have as well. Uh, just to say a few words about uh, the, uh, the project uh, that, as Janice said, we've been working on together uh, for just over a year and a half at this stage. And to set the context also in terms of the Council of Europe and the Council of Europe's role within this, and not to be confused with institutions of the European Union and so on, uh, the Council of Europe has a very special mandate, uh, I think, across the areas of uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Uh, the rule of law. You know, it's the, the cornerstone uh, the, of uh, the Council of Europe's uh, 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 remit uh, within this uh, field. Established in 1949, uh, long preceding the economic cooperation within Europe, and now comprising 47 countries, uh, so stretching far beyond uh, immediate European Union uh, borders, and including, for example, Canada as paid up observer status. We always like to think of you know, Canada as a little part of Europe sometimes, and Australia and other countries as well. Uh, so, you know, it, is, it, it has a broader reach uh, in terms of uh, its uh, motivation and support for uh, uh, democratic culture, uh, for supporting uh, democracy and so on. Now, more specifically, uh, the role of the Council of Europe, I think, in education uh, and indeed in supporting the uh, the public value of the internet have been uh, particularly noteworthy features in, in recent years. So therefore, when the invitation came to join uh, what was a small expert group uh, to lead uh, development of indicators for uh, what digital citizenship might mean for education and for educators uh, and to support the works of member states, of the Council uh, in uh, development of their work at curriculum level. Uh, this seems like a, an ideal coming together of the interests uh, uh, in, uh, in promoting a further development uh, beyond uh, some of the traditional concerns of internet safety, child protection, uh, and so on. So that's the particular context within, uh, within which uh, uh, the project has emerged within the Council uh, of Europe itself. Also to remember that uh, uh, it is also uh, something of a response uh, to the challenges uh, to democracy. Uh, and uh, I think on the back of a number of other projects that have occurred in recent years uh, towards uh, understanding uh, democracy uh, itself and democratic culture uh, within schools, uh, uh, in supports uh, for young people and understanding uh, the, the forces uh, that weigh against that and the challenges to democracy uh, in, uh, in political systems uh, everywhere. Uh, and I think uh, various different expert groups uh, across a number of projects have sought to look at what they could do to develop uh, better understanding, and also better uh, educational uh, supports. 
So within that context, uh, this is where uh, the particular uh, project has developed. And, and as we're going to uh, elaborate and show, uh, uh, a, a competence framework has been developed uh, and that uh, uh, has a particular application to citizenship and, uh, uh, and values uh, of democracy. And our particular role is to develop and evolve this within a digital environment. Uh, so where digital citizenship uh, has meaning and how uh, that uh, can be developed uh, uh, through uh, the various different kinds of means and exercises that we, uh, uh, that we can develop um, uh, as part of an education initiative. So uh, we have just uh, you know just uh, some illustration around this. It's just uh, as I've been saying, uh, the the focus to date has been uh, within uh, 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 much work in terms of uh, internet safety, uh, uh, promoting. Uh, an understanding of children's rights within the digital environment, but has that developed and uh, is there a need uh, for a greater uh, emphasis uh, to give uh, uh, towards uh, active citizenship and participation? And that's been uh, a particular interest of this particular project. Uh, the project itself um, uh, has developed or has had a number of you know, specific strands uh, to it and we will continue to work uh, in the coming year uh, and a half uh, uh, on our side of it. Uh, we have developed a literature review and that is now published uh, and available uh, on the website. I will give, uh, give you the URL uh, in a moment. Uh, developing policy guidelines uh, and uh, this is the, the Council of Europe's traditional remit to provide uh, policy guidance to ministries uh, and uh, at governmental level uh, in terms of uh, developing their own initiatives and uh, there has to be this ongoing consultation and dialogue uh, with uh, member states. Uh, we have, and uh, uh, Janice and uh, Elizabeth have done a lot of work uh, in terms of identifying and sharing uh, best practices, and that uh, is encompassed uh, within the terms of reference uh, for the project. We are moving towards uh, developing a set of descriptors uh, for uh, digital citizenship education, and this is where I suppose we're coming here uh, as a specialist education um, uh, uh, focus in terms of how we can actually develop uh, resources and materials uh, that uh, can have uh, valuable, meaningful input in terms of developing new curriculum uh, ideas. And this will be uh, the long-lasting, uh, uh, I suppose, legacy uh, of this uh, particular uh, uh, project. Um, the focus uh, that we've given uh, uh, to this, uh, and uh, just in, this is from our literature review and uh, 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 developing a, a, a synopsis uh, of what is itself quite a, a multi-level uh, and complex uh, area. We focus within digital citizenship uh, on three main areas, around engagement, uh, around responsibility, and uh, around uh, participation. And you should find in the brochure how we define digital citizenship, uh, and uh, uh, it is summarized here, uh, that uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, approach uh, is uh, uh, one that emphasizes uh, attainment of skills and competences, uh, and it is po competent and positive engagement with digital uh, uh, technologies, uh, active participation, uh, and uh, uh, responsible engagement at all levels, locally, nationally, uh, politically, uh, and in all the various different fora uh, in which uh, citizens uh, uh, participate uh, uh, in society. Uh, commitment to, to lifelong learning. And uh, uh, this is, uh, I suppose, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the great challenges of digital citizenship. It is for all. We, are all, uh, we all live digital citizenship. Uh, it is part and parcel of how we uh, now uh, uh, flourish within 21st century societies. So what is it that underpins that? And it is a, a process of lifelong learning that begins at the youngest years. And I think you know, that's the particular uh, challenge that we have uh, uh, to develop uh, resources that can support the, that activity. And as we've been talking about in our messaging uh, campaigns, it is about uh, uh, living digital uh, citizenship uh, for all citizens of all years and continuously uh, defending human dignity. 
uh, again, consonant with the, uh, the objectives and the ideals uh, that uh, sustain uh, not just the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the Council of Europe's founding mandate and its commitment uh, towards uh, supporting ongoing democratic culture, uh, human rights and uh, the rule of law. So that's how I want to just sort of set the context and the scene for where the project has come from. And uh, if I hand over to uh, 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 Janice uh, to talk about uh, some of the first outputs in terms of our framework and, uh, and models. Am I going the wrong way? Uh, keep going forward. You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. Okay. Yeah. So, some of you, I hope all of you, are familiar with Jacques Delors, who worked with UNESCO in the 90s, and he, with the UNESCO team, wrote what I consider is probably the most brilliant publication um, that I've seen in education. Uh, it's called Education, a Treasure Within. And in fact, if you read the introduction, he foresaw the problem of extremism, of radicalization. When I read it again, after about 15 years, I thought, wow, we should just have read this more closely and we would have understood and maybe prevented what's happening now. He said that school has a sole responsibility. It's to teach four pillars. Kids need to learn to know, to do, but they also learn to be and to live together. And if we skip these last two, well then what is happening to society? We see the result. And if you look at the competences, because uh, the Council of Europe, with many working groups, have now defined that there are actually 20 competences. You're not going to get them yet, but you are going to get them here, and you are going to work on them, and you are going to help us understand which uh, of the 20 should be tackled in early childhood, which should be tackled from 8 to 12 years, and which for teenage years, and we're going to do other things as well. Um, so the Council of Europe, these 20 competences, here we have them. Knowledge and critical understanding, learning to know. Skills, learning to do. Values, learning to be, and I'm talking about universal values that every teacher tries to integrate anywhere in their teaching. And attitudes. Here they are. I know you can't read them from there, but you have them printed. For democratic citizenship, if a young person really manages to master all of these, we can uh, consider that they will know how to be citizens, how to live citizenship. You're going to get it on the sheet of paper in a moment. We have also worked, and Elizabeth did an enormous amount of work behind this, looking at every publication that was talking about the domains that are involved for using technology wisely. And we've broken it down into 10 domains. Being online includes access, inclusion, learning, creativity, media, and information literacy. So it's all there. Well-being online ethics and empathy, health and well-being, e-presence and communication, rights online, active participation rights, responsibilities, privacy and security, and consumer awareness, which also includes entrepreneurship. Here's the model. Looks simple, because ages to develop. So there we go with at the base, these competences. These are what we are meant to be learning. At the heart of the competences in our temple, we have the strategies. You can get nowhere without strategies, knowing what those objectives are long term, how we want to get to them. But then you have your actors or your stakeholders, and this involves industry, which is why I sit on the safety board of Twitter and of Facebook. We have to be there 
They are stakeholders, and we need their voices, the voices of children, of parents, of everyone, but especially you, the researchers. On the other side, we can do nothing with our infrastructure and resources, and we have created nine guiding principles that we can give you in another publication or you can find online, nine guiding principles for schools on how you actually get there. Then, of course, as we all know, nothing can advance without formative, summative evaluation. You're going to feed us your ideas on this very shortly in our group work. And, of course, policy, the politicians. How do you get them on board? Well, interestingly, one of the complaints of the ministers of education in these 47 countries was that everything that we're doing right now about kids being responsible and safe online, in fact, lacks innovation. They ask for more innovation, and what we are doing right now, next week, in fact, for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in Paris, is writing a recommendation that will be implemented in every one of the 47 countries in the Council of Europe, what education systems need to do, how they can get there, and of course with lots of, of supporting material, and you're going to help us create this. Uh, wrong way. <laughs> Elizabeth and I have already uh, written a publication where you're going to find a whole lot of help. And it's called the Internet Literacy Handbook. And you can see the index here. And it's written in form of fact sheets. It's online. It's free of charge. And so we can send you the URL. We've actually implemented a lot of this because over the, since September last year, I've run a consultation with teenagers, 5,000 teenagers in 14 countries across Europe. You were meant to receive the scrapbook that they have created. Uh, it hasn't arrived, but we'll give you the link. It's all part of this, getting teachers to understand what they're meant to be doing, getting kids to implement it. Why am I talking to you about the Internet Literacy Handbook? Well, it's because we have just put the final, or have almost put the final touches to the Digital Citizenship Handbook, which defines the dimensions, definition of the theme, how it works, personal development, educational citizenship value, and then it has a fact sheet for each dimension. Ethical considerations and risks we should be aware of as teachers, ideas for classroom work, good practice, living digital citizenship, and further information and resources. So it will really be a handbook um, for teachers, for the older children, and one of the next steps of the Council of Europe will actually be define what resources are needed for early childhood, how do we develop them, and then work together towards developing uh, resources for early childhood. I'm going to pass it over to you now, Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So um, one of the things that, um, that we did in order to um, uh, come up with just working on the entire project was we did a survey. Um, and so in this survey, we looked at some of the best practices, and we also asked people who did they think were the stakeholders that would be involved in digital citizenship. So um, Janice and I did that survey, what, two summers ago? I think it's interesting. <laughs> like it was just yesterday. Um, and, and so we came up with, uh, actually not we, but the people, the respondents, they actually came up with the actors who they felt were the, the primary people involved, the main stakeholders uh, in, in uh, creating a digital citizenship education curriculum and policy. So what I have on the, on the um, PowerPoint 
are some of these stakeholders, and I'm going to run through them with you. But for me, I'm also going to do my little bit because you're going to have work afterwards. As Janice kept saying, you will work on this. You will work on that. <laughs> I was laughing because I know I know how that goes. Um, you will be able to see some of the parenting stuff, and that's what I'm going to refer to uh, in my section here. So we will do that in my group. Um, so here for the stakeholders, how many of you are teachers? Is everybody a teacher? No, not everybody. Just a show of hand, quick show of hand. Teachers, teachers, teachers. Yeah, researchers. Okay, no, because there's some who are actually teaching classrooms in the classroom. <laughs> Would you agree with this statement? Teachers play a major role in developing, enhancing the abilities of students to interpret and create digital media, helping them understand their rights and the boundaries to becoming a responsible digital citizen. Of course, you're all going to say yes, because if you said no, I would have to say, oh, Janice, we have to rewrite some things. Um, so what we show on the board, then, is some of the implications for teachers, right? We need teachers, and we need to increase their knowledge so that way they can go on and effectively work with their students. Um, obviously, then, we have to look at school management. Um, we're looking at how we're going to create a holistic environment where we include parents, teachers, just getting everyone on board, including the school board members. Um, to be a part of the whole decision making process. Of course, then we have academia, which this I think I don't have to ask everybody to raise their hands, um, where you're producing resources and research um, that can really help. Um, after that, of course, with the private sector, their implication in digital citizenship education policy is participating in new areas of cooperation. Um, and through this, always, we always say the multi stakeholder process. And actually, Genesis. It's working quite well. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we're getting some uh, good bites on this. We sort of beat them and get them to sit at the table. Well, Janice beats them and I smile. <laughs> <laughs> so then afterwards, oops, let me click here. Um, we have civil society who's able to provide new directions for future orientations, um, the educating communities, regulatory authorities, um, all of these things that we know were regulatory, uh, regulatory authorities. They have a, a larger role, right, um, that goes beyond just supervision. We're talking about ombudsmen and other things that they can do to, to help. Now I'm going to get to my two favorites, which are the students and the parents. Um, because we, we already know how important the young people are. We would, we would all not be in this room if we didn't believe this. Um, and they're just naturally the central stakeholders. They are the ones who are going to be receiving all the benefit. So for them, the implication of digital citizenship education policy is it's very simple, to educate and protect themselves as they move forward in this uh, digital environment. Now for the parents, um, the parents are really interesting because um, one of the things that we've seen is that this, this whole environment the parents are working in, it's connected, it's largely unregulated, and the parents are just kind of um, you know, out in the Wild West. But they still have this role to empower and protect their children without always knowing how. So how much more difficult is it for them to have to understand digital citizenship education and in, in bring that into their homes now? So with that in mind, um, one of the things that I just want to show you is that how we're going to be using the competences that you've seen, um, that Janice just showed you on the board, it, it, that and citizenship, we're going to be using that through parenting um, and through families, working with families. So we're looking at the parental role, um, which obviously is becoming more demanding, it's more fundamental. Parents have a lot more things to do with a lot less time to do it in. Um, parental engagement, I think I mentioned that before. It's a very, very challenging area, getting parents into the room, getting parents into the ta onto the table, um, ready to, to listen and then to take those things back home and to be reactive. Uh, and then lastly, of course, parental awareness. Um, I've said it again and again. I know Brian is sitting here and me say, but there's so many parental resources out there. You know, there, there, there are tons. You can go online. You can go find pamphlets. The, the problem is that it needs to be reinforced, and the parents need to keep hearing it. The awareness has to be there, but then it also has to continue. So um, I think that that is all that I was going to mention, except work in my group, okay, because we're going to do parents. <laughs> And next we're going to hear a little bit about teacher training, about activities. Uh, Vito has been putting this into place with great results in Portugal. Okay, thank you, Janice. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm going to try to be uh, as, as fast as possible. Uh, I'm uh, presenting here a project uh, run in Portugal, which aimed to 
to put, we can say, to put in practice all the knowledge uh, collected uh, from the digital action cost and the digital citizenship education project run by the Council of Europe. Uh, our project uh, took place in Portugal. Uh, it started in 2016 with uh, the training course attended by 25 preschool and primary school teachers. Uh, training course about digital citizenship education and democratic participation. And the idea was to help teachers develop uh, activities with their students and involving the families and the community. Uh, after the training course, we collected data from 38 parents and children through interviews and from uh, uh, several uh, institutions from the community. And then the idea was to establish uh, an, intervention, an intervention plan uh, in order to try to answer to, or, to, or to verify our main hypothesis. That was, if a concerted approach within the family, school, and community empower, really empowers preschool and primary school children to exercise an active citizenship in the 21st century. Our methodology is well known, so I think I don't need to explain the methodology, methodology developed uh, by Jackie March and all that stuff and Rose Suit and uh, Green. Uh, and this is one this is one of the three activities we developed with the teachers about fifty different digital citizenship education activities. I'm going to present only three. Uh, how, ma uh, how many teachers? Ten teachers and two hundred students and families were involved. Also the local municipality the municipality of Odi Village, and we were also uh, always in contact with different people, uh, for, for instance, uh, Janice, Brian, and Elizabeth, of course, and Stefan Chaudron, and Berlin and Gabriel in the United States, uh, because uh, we really needed to have feedback on the activities developed. Uh, we decided to uh, organize a printed newspaper, because after uh, several discussions, even the teachers, they said, no, we need to start printed. We need to use printed materials, otherwise it will be impossible, because we don't talk with parents, and the results show, really, really show that. <laughs> we don't talk with parents about digital citizenship. Parents don't talk, usually, with their, their, their sons, and we have this problem to, uh, to overcome this problem, we need the printed material, okay. So the idea was to start digital citizenship education activities, with printing printed materials, okay? Uh, all the school newspaper has uh, information, general information, but each, each edition has a main theme, main topic. The first edition was being a digital citizen. What does it mean? They discussed that with the community, with the parents, uh, among them. The second was, uh, how can we prevent and tackling violence at school? The third one, how can we reinvent playgrounds? Is it possible? We don't like our playground. Can we reinvent another one and ask the municipality to change our playground, please? Uh, this academic here, the student said, okay, we chose the name of the newspaper, but now we would like to do something with image, with video. Okay, so the teachers organized ourselves, uh, themselves, and they started uh, a TV news show. It's a news service. Uh, they asked the students, please, during the weekend, ask your family, other relatives, your friends, whatever, what, uh, it, which is the most important news story, and try to get some information on it, and you can explain that next Monday. And you can, uh, video record, all the, all the presentations and then organize uh, a new service for, for us here in the school. Uh, they did it. I have a video here. I hope it works. <laughs> this is one of you. Uh, 
This is the teacher. Okay, so the idea was that maybe we are going to need to ask journalists to rethink new services because children, they are not able to understand and they are really worried about. This is only one example from the 16 they voted, because from the 105 news, they voted the 16 more important for them. This is a new habit in school. They vote for everything. Uh, the third activity was developed with the preschoolers. And the idea was, can, we have already rethinked uh, the playground, but can we reimagine, reinvent the school, all the school? And uh, the idea was, uh, this is the, the school, here we have the football field, here the primary school building, here it's a canteen, the preschool building, and then the, the, the space uh, that you can consider, the playground. Uh, and first, we, said, we asked them, can you please draw the school? And they were there, and the main building is there too. They, uh, really like to do the activity, but this this activity was not uh, enough. They need to do more. So the idea we have really, I think we we were inspired by Makey Project. Okay, <laughs> this is a Makey Project. It's not maybe a Makey Makey, but uh, the idea is a Makey Project. And we asked them to dream the school, and the main building just vanished. <laughs> because it's a, a preschool work. This work has, uh, was organized with uh, one of the mothers, which is a, um, an architect, and the husband uh, of the oldest teacher is an engineer, and he's helping. Uh, the idea now is to send not only photos, but the scale model to the municipality asking them, please change our school. We don't want our school as it is. And this is, in my uh, humble opinion, citizenship education. <laughs> so, having this in mind, some preliminary results, because it's impossible to the project start because it seems impossible to explain everything, but uh, the idea is, the, the, journal, the, local, the, the school newspaper, sorry, uh, became the local newspaper, the teachers uh, distributed the, the newspaper all over. Uh, parents are very keen to participate, and especially now, but uh, officially the project ended because the funding ended in February, but it's impossible to stop the project. They keep asking, and I, uh, of course I'm working with them, and I'm still working with, with them. So we think that the concerted approach can really work. In terms of next steps, and to finish, uh, we are going to publish uh, Sense Making Practices and book with 50 activities uh, next September, September, October. The, uh, the uh, school newspaper, Cusco, uh, is going online. Now it's time to go online. Now it's time to have uh, maybe a YouTube page. Now it's time to produce other videos and other uh, materials uh, that can be uh, available online. The next TV news service will be produced at the University, Autonomous University of, of Lisbon, with the support from the National Journalists Union. Uh, we also are going to apply, because it's impossible to end the project, we need to, to find some funding. Uh, we are going to apply to the Portuguese National Reading Plan, and starting next September, uh, I hope with the support from Carlos Bank Banking Foundation, we are going to replicate this project in the poorest area of uh, Lisbon. That's all, thank you. So, you've met us all, and maybe what I should have started by saying, maybe you guessed, is that Vito, besides uh, his PhD in education, is a journalist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth 
lawyer and expert in parenting, Brian, um, but I'm not sure what your field is. Education, professor of education. Well, I was a media teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I come back uh, from a background, primary school teacher, teacher trainer, uh, lecturer in law and instructional design. And so I think you can see that putting all these bits together, it's a dream team. <laughs> 